Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Bay Area Global Health Alliance second annual meeting. And this is actually the second time we've had something in person, except for last week when we had the WHO delegation. It's almost been since 2020 since we've been together. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I am honored to serve as the executive director. And it's great to see so many people in person and to thank all of those of you who are joining us by Zoom. And for you people on Zoom, just so you know, there aren't quite as many mermaids and centaurs as I kind of thought there would be. Most people are here. Um, so anyway, because of all of you, the Alliance is now a global health community of more than 60 member organizations, world-class academic institutions, NGOs, and nonprofits, tech companies, biotech, and other private sector companies. Everyone here is committed to working together to build connections across the sectors and sharing knowledge to advance global health equity and innovation. Our inaugural year 2020 came at the time of the COVID pandemic. The last couple of years have been devastating for so many. One million deaths in the US alone. We all know so well that COVID laid bare the inequities in our world, in our country, and even here at home in the Bay Area. But the light is that because of you all, so many in this room and, our, and in our network, because of that you all have worked tirelessly, accelerating technology, advancing science and care, millions of lives have been saved around the world too. As we put together our newsletter every month, I am truly humbled by the advancements this community has made. Today is about strengthening that community, celebrating achievements, and most importantly, looking at the future to see what work we can do together and how we can support each other to have a uh, to catalyze change. So here's a brief look at our agenda. Can we turn to that slide? There we go. So for all of you, there's a QR code that's out in the lobby. And then there's also at bit.ly, um, you can get both the agenda and the attendees list. And we're gonna start in just a few minutes with Amy Lynn, who is the acting director of USAID Center for Innovation and Impact. And she will be in a fireside chat with Mary Pittman, PHI CEO and president and our board chair. They're gonna be looking at where the sector, global health sector is going. After that, we will have flash talks um, on the state of global health financing and innovation. We have wonderful representatives from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. They will be in those talks and that will be moderated by Neha Agarwal, our co-vice chair of the board. And then the last thing that we will have is just a little bit more on the state of the Alliance, and we're gonna be highlighting some of our key partnerships. More details are in your agenda at that um, bit.ly, or if you go to the QR code, we're trying to save paper. But I also wanted to talk to you a little bit more about networking. Networking will be um, not just at the end, but all through and in, as an integral part of this meeting. So when we have a break, we want to ask you to introduce yourself to at least three or four people in person. I know a lot of you know each other already through Zoom and otherwise. Um, let them know your name, your organization, your focus area now, and also maybe introduce your 10-year-old self. So like, I'll model it for you. My name is Sarah Anderson. While I am now the executive director of the Alliance, at 10, I was playing my cello in the school orchestra. I was playing in the creeks and the woods by my house, and I was watching the news, Walter Cronkite, every night, um, and dreaming of working in Washington, D.C. 
So that's who I was at 10. And I guess some things have changed and some things haven't. So I think you'll have fun with that exercise, but probably more to point and more relative to our community. On the back wall, you'll find a lot of different focus areas and tons of stickies and things around the room, stickies and um, Sharpies for you to go ahead and add your organization name to whatever area that you're interested in, both in how you work is going this way and your region of focus is going that way. And then we also just wanted to know what you thought are some of the biggest global health trends. So there's a sheet for that. And then ways we can collaborate because that's why we're all here and we wanna coordinate the types of collaborations and partnerships you have now, the ones that maybe you want to have and ideas on how we can strengthen those partnerships. So we ask you to kind of go around the room at your breaks and be able to do that. And the evening will end with, the afternoon will end with us all having an opportunity to get to know each other more. And if you're comfortable outside without a mask, we're gonna be having drinks and nibbles outside. And I hope you all will be able to stay until the end of the evening with us. So for all of you on Zoom, there's opportunities to network as well in the chat and Abby will be helping being your host there. We're sorry Abby can't be with her. Her six-year-old is doing well, but he just turned up with COVID yesterday. So she wasn't able to fly here. And we hope you'll find those useful and, and make some new connections that way. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our board of directors, many of whom who are in this room today. Truly, without this tireless, without their tireless service and bold ideas of these global health leaders, we would not be where we are today. As I call your name, please stand. And if you are joining by Zoom, please wave. So I'd like to introduce Mary Pittman our board chair, Hema Bujaraju, who is on Zoom with us today, Neha Agarwal, slide please, Jonathan, oh, Jonathan made it, yay, <laughs> Jonathan, and Colin Boyle, Donna Mazet, next slide. Puma Abbasi, and I believe that she is joining us by Zoom. Mark Allen. Darren is traveling, so he's not with us today. Next slide. Michelle Berry will be joining us in person in a little bit. Steph Bertozzi. Nisha was going to be with us, but she ended up taking a COVID test this morning and she has COVID, so she won't be able to join us. Next slide. Dennis um, was stuck in New York, so I don't believe he's going to be able to join us. Pranima Main, I know, is on Zoom, so welcome, Pranima. And Amy Adelberger is on Zoom, I believe. And next slide. Praveen Raja, and I think Praveen was also traveling, but he was going to try to join us. And Jaime Suvita, I'm so sorry, and is also um, on sabbatical this year. And we're also so lucky to have Jeremy um, from UCSF, who is able to help us and our host today with Robert Mansfield. So thank you, those are all of our board members. Oh, our two new ones, Martin Dale. Oh, there's Martin from PSI. And Martin gets the uh, Travels the Furthest Award because he is here from Nairobi. And then Krista Donaldson. So we are thrilled to have such so many people here and thank you all for your service. And without any further ado, I said that twice. I'm now going to turn over the microphone to Mary Pittman. Thank you so much, Sarah. 
Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome everyone to the second annual meeting of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. Uh, Amy, are you on and can you just uh, make a sound so we know that you're connected? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am on. I Great. tried to unmute and stop my video, but hopefully that'll work at some point. <laughs> Great. Well, well, welcome. And I'm going to model what Sarah said, and I'm going to introduce myself. When I was 10 years old, I was um, probably practicing dance, and um, I was hoping to be a physician someday. I knew I wasn't going to be a professional dancer, so that was purely for fun. So Amy, um, you're, we're so pleased to have you join us today, and I am going to ask you to not model exactly what Sarah said, but before we have you start talking about your task of uh, sharing some of the mega trends in global health and particularly talking about um, those trends in light of decolonization, in light of uh, the pandemic and what post pandemic will look like, and also um, climate change and a number of the other issues that are facing us why don't you start out telling people just a little bit about your background, and then you can tell them what you were doing when you were 10 years old. Sounds good. Um, maybe I'll do reverse chronological order then. Thank you so much for the invitation and so pleased to be here today. Um, my background has been a bit of a nomad um, as I've moved between continents and sectors. And I think that really speaks to the innovation um, angle, both that I do in my current role, but also that seems to, um, thrive in this network as well. So I currently, of course, am with the Center for Innovation and Impact, or CII, at USAID in the Global Health Bureau. Before that, I was based in Mumbai, India, where I worked for um, a few years looking at market-based approaches to international, develop international development challenges, particularly focused on safe drinking water in slums and um, sustainable, business uh, sustainable business models to bring toilets in rural areas. Uh, prior to that, I had led uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative's HIV program in Liberia, spending um, a, a really immersive time there working closely with the National AIDS Control Program and the Ministry of Health in thinking about their HIV products and services and how to both increase access to, to both products and services as well as strengthening the overall health system. Um, prior to that, I had actually spent time with the World Bank um, as part of their innovation team with the Development Marketplace and then previously had spent time with the private sector as well as uh, working with small and micro enterprises in Peru um, with a nonprofit called TechnoServe. So really I'm endlessly curious and that's what brings me between sectors, private, public and nonprofit and different development areas, including global health um, and thinking about how to draw connections uh, where possible. Um, I don't think I saw this future for myself when I was 10 um, at that time. I think I was more focused on um, the tennis lessons and the piano lessons that my parents were dragging me to. Um, I was curious about um, other countries and so was excited to travel. Um, and then I think the other real statement I made at 10 was um, the volume of hair that I had because I had a huge perm um, because it was the 80s. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad well, I shed the perm. I have managed to travel and I do like playing tennis, but I have dropped the piano. <laughs> That's great. I think everyone in the room and on Zoom can understand why we invited you to talk about global trends. You've obviously been looking at them and living with them for a long time. So let me begin there and maybe you could tell us where you see the global sector going in the next five to 10 years. First of all, I just wanted to note how appreciative I am of having this question. I think taking the time to pause and reflect on the future is so important, especially when things are coming at us so often and with so many urgent deadlines. And so as we think about the future, I think it also reflects our values and how we understand the present. So what are the current trends that we're already seeing today that are only going to get more magnified over the next 10 years, 20 years? How can we think all the way to a generation ahead and therefore be more prepared and proactive for um, the, what we anticipate might happen then, um, as opposed to only reacting to trends as they appear. So I think a couple of key trends really jump to mind as we've been thinking about what that future could look like. One is certainly, I'm just gonna adjust the light here um, in case that helps with the glare. Um, one is certainly around thinking about the climate, climate change, extreme weather events, climate factors, 
whether it's rainfall or extreme temperatures or extreme weather events, how do we better understand how climate change and global health intersect? And what are the tools at our disposal to um, map out what we can do to prepare? Uh, I think artificial intelligence and advanced analytics are really important tools that can be harnessed to look at this increasingly complex space. Um, so happy to talk more about that. I will note that, of course, analytical tools are only as good as the data that feeds them. And so the more that we can think about um, not only examining complex relationships between climate change and global health, but making sure we have the data to map those out, to describe them, to predict different scenarios, and to um, examine different uh, trade-offs to make recommendations uh, will equip us better to be ready for that future. If we look beyond just the, the broadest possible global um, setting of climate change and global health, how do we also take into account that the global health space requires funding and money and resources in order to take the steps that we might, um, we might identify as we do that analysis. The global health donor community will not have enough funding uh, to meet all of the needs and to reach the sustainable development goals that we have set for ourselves. We're already, actually before the pandemic, we were $135 billion short every year. And now we have only gone further um, only have a greater need for financial resources uh, to catch up to where we were before the pandemic and hopefully make even greater strides. So how do we think about bringing in new types of capital into this space? I think part of it is around innovative financing or, or blending different kinds of capital. So looking at how grant capital can connect with commercial seeking capital and uh, maybe slightly below market returns to then um, increase the pool of resources that's available to put towards global health needs and, and initiatives. And I'm happy to, to speak to a couple of the um, activities that we have underway there as examples. But then if we go back, or if we, if we started wide with the climate and, and global trends, and then moved into how do we take, think about our own sphere of action and the financing of resources, then how do we think about the decision-making and who has the power in global health? How can we make sure that it's really local stakeholders, the communities that we serve, who are really in the driver's seat, who are helping set the priorities, who are uh, mapping out the solutions that they think will be most valuable for them, and who best understand the needs uh, that, that are present in their context. Um, they, are, they are the ones with the lived experience that really gives the best insight. So how can we reconsider how um, decision-making and resources are allocated to really prioritize those local voices? I'm really glad you brought up innovative financing as, as one of the issues to highlight. And our next panel will be talking about those um, issues from some other perspectives as well. When we spoke earlier, one of the things that I had asked you about was the innovative approaches that USAID is um, seeing and betting on and, and investing in themselves. Um, related to the future, particularly around uh, digital health and new technologies that can help advance digital health. Can you spend a couple minutes talking about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'll touch on the innovative financing first and then speak to some of the, the new technologies um, and the potential we see there. Um, one initiative that we're really pleased to have played a partnership role in is the Open Doors African Private Healthcare Initiative. And this is really looking at blending exactly the different types of funding that I had mentioned earlier. So how could a small amount of grant funding from a donor like uh, USAID or the President's Malaria Initiative help offset some of the costs of offering a loan guarantee, which the Development Finance Corporation, um, an arm of the US government then issued, that then was translated into over $35 million in possible working capital that could be provided to private clinics in five different countries, um, specifically Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And why this is important is, of course, it's important for those um, clinics that are serving about 5 million patients to stay open and provide high quality care and services um, in their communities. But it's also important because it demonstrates that different kinds of funders and investors can find shared interest and shared purpose and work together to allow this to happen. Um, it didn't require all grant financing, it didn't require all loan financing, um, but it allowed each type of partner to um, leverage the strength that they can bring. Um, and then the other piece that it 
helps demonstrate is that it proves that sustainable, financially viable business models in the global health sector are possible. That small private clinics offering these goods and services um, are good bets uh, for these working capital loans. And there actually hasn't been a single default on that on any of those loans so far. So I think it's just a really nice way of demonstrating um, even under the strain of a pandemic, there are really viable business models that can be both generative, um, can both generate a positive uh, return on investment and a bottom line and produce a uh, positive social impact. And then I think the role of technology is crucial here. Uh, we are in an, in an increasingly connected world. Um, cell phones are ubiquitous, uh, data and internet access are increasingly widespread. And we have those artificial intelligence, machine learning and advanced analytics tools that we didn't have um, or was readily available in the past. So what can we do to make sure that these are really valuable for the global health goals that we're concerned with? I think one is to know what tools we have. And so one project that we've undertaken is to look at uh, mapping over uh, nearly 3000 digital health tools um, across over hundred countries, uh, low and middle income countries to see what's already in operation and which of those could be quickly adapted to meet COVID response needs. And we actually um, contributed that, um, that knowledge base into the WHO's digital health atlas. Um, we then took that information to also um, customize it to 22 specific, um, 22 of our partner countries so that they could take that learning and see how to invest in those tools that people already exist, uh, that are already using and already know exist to use it for these new needs. So I think that's one example where in a COVID response, you can quickly see what you have and try and adapt it and repurpose it to a new need. Um, and then I think a different piece is anticipatory. How can we take new tools and really use them to um, examine what might be coming over the horizon? And this is the nascent field that I was just describing of climate change and global health and artificial intelligence. Um, climate data is um, increasingly being used to predict extreme weather events and, and plan for those. That those weather events will affect global health service provision. So how do we break down the silos that separates what might be considered climate data over here and health data over there? We want those bridges to be built so that health uh, program analysts are using climate data to inform their understanding of health needs going forward. And similarly, we want climate scientists to be aware of the health implications of their data. So the more that we can draw on um, complex data analytics to um, assess the, and interpret the kinds of data that we already have access to and invest in further building out that database, I think the better prepared we will be for, for future trends. Um, and I will put in a shameless plug that we are doing an analysis right now on exactly this nexus between AI or advanced analytics and climate change and global health. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. That, that's great. And I know that there are a lot of people in this room who are very interested in that. And I'm, I'm sure we'll probably have a lot of questions people want to share with you even after this session. When you were talking about you know, AI and data processing, what are some of the ways that USAID and, and your group in particular might be providing support to some of the priority countries to really create some trusted and trustworthy models, because we know that in some places they don't necessarily trust giving all of that data to a central repository. Could you just talk a little bit about that and what kind of capacity we might be needing to build? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. I think almost before the question of what, are, what investments are we ready to make, we need to make sure we know um, what are we hoping to achieve with these AI or AA tools? And we recognize that there's a risk that goes along with the potential. Um, so we have to be cognizant of risks of data bias, of, um, of analytics that don't reflect the communities uh, that they're intended to serve, um, and really be mindful and intentional about the guardrails that we might put up uh, around those. And so I think continuing to have conversations like these and with our country partners on what goals are they trying to achieve? How can we help uh, support them in those efforts on the data collection side, on the, capabil on the capability side, so that ministries of health have 
teams in-house that can interpret and analyze this type of data, and then ultimately to inform their decisions on how they make uh, plans and invest in global health programs. So we're excited to um, be just at the beginning stages of this journey. Um, I think the report that I mentioned is one step. We had done an, a previous analysis of artificial intelligence and global health more broadly to think about the use cases and now are um, really trying to think through how they can be applied. We also worked um, with our Office of HIV and AIDS and our South Africa mission to really look at how this could be applied to um, reaching HIV goals in South Africa and really pleased to see the leadership that they have shown in taking this forward as well. So I don't think it'll be um, a one size fits all approach and there will certainly be pioneers in different ways but we're seeing between the climate strategy that the agency just released um, in the last two weeks, plus a new um, artificial intelligence um, action plan and the increasing interest we're hearing from our country counterparts, that there is a real scope and interest here and would welcome uh, if there are interested parties in this audience who might want to um, contribute to these efforts as well. I'm sure you'll be hearing from some folks you know, this is all very, very exciting. And I know that USAID has had new leadership come in to global health. And certainly it's starting to show in some of the programs and directions that you've been sharing with us today. But how could you summarize some of the USAID priorities in light of the change of leadership? And what might be some of the areas that are still uh, to be explored and maybe this group could help? Absolutely. Yes, we are thrilled to have our new leadership on board. Our administrator, Samantha Power, just finished her one year anniversary a, a few weeks ago. Um, our Global Health Bureau is now led by Assistant Administrator Tula Gawande, um, and both, of course, are, are thought leaders in their own right before joining USAID, and, and we're really benefiting from their, uh, their leadership now. Administrator Power um, really outlined uh, specific priorities that the agency can really take to heart as we look towards the future. Um, some of you may have heard her speech on inclusive development um, and the vision for inclusive development at Georgetown back in November. And what it really emphasized was this idea of inclusivity. How do we make sure that what we're doing is uh, really closely listening to the communities that we serve, is in support of partner countries, and is prioritizing uh, local voices as, as we move forward. Um, so one component of that that we're really excited about is trying to apply that to the role of innovation. Our center is a center for innovation and impact. And so we're always looking to incubate new ideas, put them into practice, and help them to scale through partnership. And so how can we take that general framework and make sure that we're centering it around priorities and decisions that are made by uh, local community members in the areas where we, where we wanna work. We have hosted a number of grand challenges in the past, um, and those have surfaced excellent and transformative innovations. Um, they have been largely tilted towards innovators based in high income country settings. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is what might we have missed uh, by not um, being able to tap into as, many, as much of the local ingenuity. And so we're really taking a closer look at that now to think about locally driven innovation. That also relates to one of the examples that Administrator Power has highlighted, which is taking the power of human-centered design or social um, behavior, uh, behavioral economics to really think about how do we understand our customer or client first and what they care about, and then see how we can situate um, the products or services that we're offering into that context rather than hoping it'll work the other way around. Um, so we're looking at different ways that we've already used human-centered design in um, increasing access to uh, HIV prevention materials and, and products, and also drawing lessons learned from across the industry through um, peer learning and peer-reviewed journals. So we're excited about the, the roadmap that they have laid out for us, really centering it on local perspectives, on being inclusive, um, and also thinking in new ways and working with the private sector. And I think all of those are, are really in line with how we're operating as well at the center. That's great. I'm sure a number of the folks who are from academia and um, are looking at the workforce of the future are thinking, how might we be training people differently to address some of these goals? I know this isn't something that we talked about, but it really came to my mind while you were speaking. Can you just briefly 
address if there's been some discussion of that and what are some of the key points? I think there's a lot of discussion on how not just training, but um, really embedding uh, and strengthening teams. So uh, rather than thinking just about in one individual, how can we strengthen an entire team as they look at new processes, as they think about um, strategic planning or, or change management or, or just executing against an important initiative. Um, one partnership that we have uh, really been a part of since its founding is the Aspen Management Partnership for Health. And that has really emphasized how can we support um, ministries of health in executing on their top priorities by equipping them with um, leadership and management um, support and capability building, including seconding a mid-career professional, often from the private sector, uh, to be really embedded with that team and not support just one leader, but really build a, a team of leaders and to share learnings from across countries. Um, so I think that collaborative approach um, that is really keyed into local priorities is really indicative of how we want to strengthen skills and, and support our partner countries in what they are leading themselves. That's really exciting to hear because that was a strategy we took in the Global Health Fellows Program, so I'm glad to hear that it's, it's resurfacing again. Before I move to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask you one final question. In the past, you've talked about the broader ecosystem and the need to bridge the silos between sectors. That's one of the reasons the Bay Area Global Health Alliance was founded, to bridge the gap between academia, between nonprofits, between the tech sectors. And um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that cross-sector connection and collaboration to tackle these huge challenges might be supported from the Bay Area Global Health Alliance and all of our members with the work that you and your teams are trying to do at USAIG? It's a, it's a good question. And it's a, um, an, I love the open-ended nature of it because I think it's really conversations like these where we can share what we um, bring to the table and what we care about that help us spark new collaborations. So I think selfishly, if there are members who are interested in uh, locally based innovation and enabling that in innovative financing or in thinking about how artificial intelligence and advanced analytics can help us tackle some of these uh, complex global health trends like climate change, we would really welcome that engagement. I think more broadly, continuing to have um, forums where different groups that might not interact organically or otherwise can come together and share what their um, different interests are related to global health and seeing what needs they have that might be filled by, by others is really important. That matchmaking is so hard to do um, from a top-down perspective and often I think is a bit of the serendipity to hear what are um, the priorities and the driving forces for, for very disparate groups who can bring diverse skill sets to bear and then find a way uh, to work together to, to accomplish shared goals. And then also recognizing that not every positive interaction will necessarily end with a collaboration. I think just informing our own situational awareness about what is happening in global health, um, innovation, equity, and other common spaces is really important so that we can make sure not to duplicate efforts, but also build on each other's experiences and lessons learned as we go forward. So I, I welcome any outreach and engagement from, from your members, and I hope that other conversations uh, continue um, among um, in all of those networking sessions that I heard sound um, exciting after these uh, discussions. That was a little bit of a shameless pitch for the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. However, I do believe there are some huge opportunities. And now it's the opportunity for our, our folks here in the audience to ask questions of Amy. And if I could have someone take a mic, I think um, since we're, all right, thank you. And Krista Donaldson had her hand up first, so she gets the first question. Hi, Amy. It's Krista from Equalize Health. Thank you for joining us today. I want to pick up, actually, I'm going to ask two questions if that's okay, both um, based on what Mary was asking. The first was, I really love that you said look to our values. Um, I think that's important both for trends, but our values as a country are often tied to our politics. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so a question for you, if you had a crystal ball, I know you've been talking about with a new administrator, um, um, Samantha Powers, but if you, if the election, for example, goes to a Trump ally next year, what will our values look like? And I think also following the Alito leaked uh, memo on Roe versus Wade, I'm just wondering if you could maybe comment on what you're thinking for the future and what USAID, what, maybe what the gossip is. <laughs> and we do understand as a government representative, there will be some things that you can't say. Yes, <laughs> but we're in, we're in a safe space. <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> Okay, maybe not. That is a tricky question. Krista, did you have a second one you said? <laughs> sure. Do you want to comment at all? Oh, no. I thought okay, you wanted to ask fine. me both at once. Um, I do, but I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to be. Uh, well, I will say, just as Mary had, had noted, um, I am certainly a, a bureaucrat and therefore am not at liberty to comment or share any of the goss. Um, Fair on, enough on these pieces, um, but I, re I recognize that's on many people's minds. My second question then is, um, you know, we're all working on problems that are global in nature and global problems require global teams and global partnerships. And I wanted to, you know, I think for many of us, USAID is this incredibly powerful engine to push things ahead. And sometimes it's a bureaucracy and, you know, it's this mixed number of things, but I would love your advice for us you know, again, different industry actors, academia, um, startups, and all sorts of things. What advice do you have for us for engaging and learning from the different groups at USAID? Well, on the second one, actually, it's one of the priorities of our new administrator, Administrator Power, to engage with new and um, non-traditional USAID partners. And there's actually a new website that's um, been stood up just focused on how to work with USAID, even if you never have before. <laughs> um, and so I think there really is this push to um, make it more streamlined and efficient and less onerous uh, to engage with us. So I, I hope that that bears fruit. Um, and I, I don't think it's too much to, to characterize our, our bureaucracy as not always being the most, um, it, that it can be a little bit daunting for a partner who hasn't worked with us before. I think along with streamlining the, the processes and the paperwork, um, there's also an interest in looking at more creative ways of engaging than, than we might have done before. Um, and I think that really speaks to the private sector engagement component of uh, what our new leadership is really emphasized as well. So how can we think about the strengths of, that companies offer in, in many different ways? Um, sometimes it can be their uh, staff and the specialized skills that they offer. It can be their in-country networks. Um, it could be their of course, funding resources, um, but it can also be their channels and their access to different, um, different communities. For example, um, many of you may have heard of our partnership uh, with Coca-Cola called Project Last Mile. And I think what's really interesting about that partnership is not that it leverages just the skill sets of Coca-Cola in um, distributing uh, or leveraging the strength that Coca-Cola clearly has in being able to offer a cold Coke anywhere in the world. And so how can we make use of that cold chain knowledge and op network optimization to do the same for vaccines or other medical products, but also their strategic marketing and how they've been able to really reach young people in different communities um, so that everybody not only can get a Coke, but they want to have a Coke. And how can we do the same for COVID vaccines or, or uh, other health products? And so I think looking at the different strengths uh, creatively that new partners can bring um, is another part of the push uh, that we are um, excited to embrace from with our new leadership and, and going forward. Thank Great. you so much, Mark. You want to take the next question? Hi, Amy. It's Mark Allen from Merck Mothers. Nice to see you. Um, we've worked with you guys in the past, whether it be the Ukrish Impact Bond in India or the Moms Initiative with the DFC. And I've always been impressed with the Center of Innovation Impact because you have limited budget, but you seem to have outsized ambition in terms of what you guys can kind of accomplish. And I'm just curious, even with a new administration, how your team is working effectively, because you are sort of centralized in DC and kind of are reliant at the mission level in terms of trying to insert some of these innovations, which may go against the grain, whether it be just, you know, catalytic innovation that's not popular, it might create disincentives in terms of exposure or transparency or just sort of disrupt kind of the prevailing uh, business as usual. So I, I just I'm curious as to see how you guys 
uh, with limited budget, are able to kind of uh, really have that impact at the ground. And if there's going to be any structural changes or any additionality in terms of kind of um, you know your your gunpowder in terms of some of the, the financing that you guys could help seed some of these opportunities. Thanks, Mark. Yes, you know as well, and I think boundless ambition and a lot of energy will go a long way uh, to, to offset our, our very limited budget, as you nicely put it. I think at its core, one key driver of how we operate is our team value. So picking up on another aspect of what Krista had mentioned in her first question, and really thinking about building an entrepreneurial, innovative risk-taking, strategic risk-taking environment um, that allows us to pursue new opportunities, even when uh, the bureaucratic inertia might be um, might be in a different direction. And so that has been really important to us is building a supportive, empathetic, and also fun team that takes our work seriously, but also has a sense of humor um, so that we can uh, support each other through the, the successes and also through the setbacks. I think an important aspect of that is also collaboration with others. Um, so we try to build an entrepreneurial spirit internally, and we also recognize our success is only possible by partnering with our technical teams, our country teams, and many external groups um, outside as well. And so how can we think about uh, perhaps helping um, catalyze the first demonstration case, but then recognizing that it would have to scale by um, working through an existing health program that's probably run by a different office and with, with other resources? How can we work with other funders um, where they might be interested in a, a proven concept um, after the first few pilots, uh, but don't have the flexibility to take on that risk at the beginning? Uh, so it's really recognizing where our flexibility, our um, curiosity, and our specialized expertise in innovation or market access and digital health can really play um, a, a helpful catalytic role within USAID and then doing it in partnership with others to, to help it scale and, and really get to that impact on the ground. Because otherwise we are very removed as a very small team based in headquarters and know that we're reliant on our implementing partners and our country teams for that, um, that true implementation. So I know that your time is limited and we've got about five minutes left. And so we're going to take two quick last questions. Are you okay with that, Amy? Thanks. Yeah, that works. Hi, Amy. Uh, my name is Malcolm, and I lead strategic partnerships with POSI. I'm interested to understand how the global health community can learn about the innovation investments you've made, and then actually participate in the goals that you have around scaling them uh, in, uh, for impact. Why don't we take the second, is it along those lines, Steph, or no? Okay, let's take that and then we'll finish off with Steph. Okay, oh, well, first of all, please go to our website, usa.gov slash CII and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um, we do try to uh, share our learnings and um, publish reports uh, of our work online. Um, so, so do check that out. Um, there, is, uh, there are specific pieces there, um, including in our most recent uh, impact brief, that mentions more about the financing partnership I mentioned, ODAFI, the Open Doors African Private Healthcare Initiative. Um, so that's one area. And, and of course, also follow us on social media and Twitter. Um, I think the other piece is um, really looking at these targeted um, forums uh, where there might be a topic of interest. So I know that um, the, a, a group that might be interested in artificial intelligence and climate change may not necessarily be the same as interested in innovative financing. And so we do try to convene uh, different um, communities of practice or stakeholders on the topical areas we're working on um, to, to share what we're learning as well. So as PSI or, or you particularly are interested in individual efforts related to these, we, can, um, we would welcome adding you to those distribution forums. Thank you, Amy. Steph, last Steph. question, make it good. <laughs> no Steph pressure. Steph Kelsey from UC Berkeley. Amy, you started off with um, understandable concerns about climate. If we're going to avoid uh, millions or even hundreds of millions of climate migrants, we're going to have to have climate adapted agriculture. We're going to have to have water availability. Um, I understand your team is small, but across the US government, we don't see a moonshot of investment and innovation in drought resistant crops and salinity adjust adapted crops in um, a, a alternative sources of water, desalinization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is it going to take to get the U.S. government to invest 
in climate resilience in a way that's commensurate with the scale of the threat? Well, I think getting the US government to invest is in some ways asking um, how will Congress who determines our budget <laughs> make that investment? And so I will definitely leave that one aside um, to, the, to the same point as to Krista's earlier question. But I think a piece that is very much on our minds within USAID and our current programming is how do we see the needs um, and what can we do about them within our existing budgets and existing programs? So I did mention that USAID recently released um, our climate strategy. And so that is one step in that direction to really map out some of the priorities in that direction. I am based in the Global Health Bureau, so I would not be the right expert on um, drought resistant crops and, and other agricultural practices, um, but certainly my colleagues are, are looking at, at those domains. I think the other piece to consider, oh, and also of course, um, the US government's PREPARE initiative is also looking at at many of these activities. But I think the other part of your question that's really interesting and important to reflect on is resilience and versatility. And what can we do as a community, whether we're looking at the crops or the health clinic infrastructure or telehealth or any other measure that can help us adapt to climate change consequences and maximize the versatility of our investments. So what could work to provide services to very stable communities and those that are suddenly seeing an influx of migrants, whether due to climate change or to um, instability or to any other reason. What are types of delivering health quality and services, whether it's brick and mortar or telehealth that can withstand heat waves and floods and other extreme weather events? So how can we think about the edges and the most extreme situations of how we will need to provide um, health products and services in the future and um, make it make investments that respond to those extremes as much as we can. Because if we can respond in a flood and um, a heat wave, if we can respond to a small stable population and a sudden surge um, that comes with migrants, then we're probably in a good place to be resilient against other shocks that we might not anticipate as well. Thank you, Amy. I probably should have said penultimate question because I was remiss in not taking questions from the uh, web audience. So if you don't mind, there was uh, one last one that I'd like to tee up if you can take a minute more. It's from Dr. Obeid Kabanda at Global Fund for Women. And she said, given the increasing occurrences of crisis and emergencies like Ukraine, Syria, Afghanistan, et cetera, uh, where do you see the trend for global health and centering women's global health in times of crisis? And I know there are a lot of people in this room who are nodding their heads that that's an important question. Yeah, no, I'm happy to, to reflect on that as well. It is a very important question. I think the um, increasingly we're seeing situations where a classic stable development context is blurring with a humanitarian relief context. And I think to my uh, to the point I was just making earlier about what can we think about around versatility and um, enabling consistency and resilient services despite shocks. I think that really extends to um, unstable situations and wars like we're seeing in Ukraine and um, in other um, unstable, unstable geographies. I think it also doesn't shift um, based on that context in terms of how much we center those services around women and girls. I think we all see that investing in women and girls helps their families, um, enables empowerment uh, that is crucial for their own rights, but also for their communities. And so regardless of whether we're working in a politically stable or unstable situation, um, it's a really important priority, including for this administration, to make sure that we are paying special attention to um, ensuring equal rights, um, especially for women and girls. Thank you very much, Amy, for not only uh, meeting with us today, but opening up some opportunities for us to follow up with you in the future. And I think everybody would agree this was a, a great launch to our annual meeting. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you so much, Mary, for that great talk. Really enjoyed it. And as we all know, and we just heard as well from Amy Lynn, we're in quite a unique time in global health. On the one hand, there is, we've never spent more on health and pandemic preparedness. 
And yet, on the other hand, COVID has set us back, and we actually have one of the largest gaps in health uh, financing, $135 billion annually and growing. <clears throat> As we think about LMICs, we have major setbacks to existing essential services, routine services for pregnancy and newborn health, uh, childhood immunizations, and not to mention all the setbacks we see in HIV, TB, and malaria. But on the positive side, we're also going through a power paradigm shift with a lot of us advocating for decolonization of our sector and shifting global health decision-making and financing decisions to LMICs directly. How governments, donors, and philanthropists think about funding will set the stage for global health programming over the next decade. And so it is with that context that I am very pleased to introduce you to our three panel panelists, one who is here with us in person, Oliver Rothschild, who is the Managing Director for the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. Thank you for being here. And if we can maybe shift to the video for our virtual guest, we have Dana Hovig, who is the Director of Gender Equity and Governance at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and Shannon Larson, who is our Senior Program Officer, Development Policy and Finance at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Hello, Dana. Nice to have you. And hey. I think we've got Shannon up there in the corner. Welcome both. So um, Dana, let's start with you. Um, Amy Lynn has shared some interesting um, feedback on USAID and how they're thinking about financing. And you recently wrote an article about the journey towards centering equity and shifting power in your grant making at the, at the Hewlett Foundation. Can you tell us maybe a little bit more about your journey and what it means for our Bay Area Global Health Alliance members in terms of how uh, a major foundation such as the Hewlett Foundation is thinking about financing in the future? Great, thanks Neha. And, and sorry everyone, I, I, I can't be there. I'm only an hour south. Uh, and would love to sort of get practice again of in-person meetings. So I'm sorry I'm not there, but thanks for inviting me to speak. And, and I guess I'll talk for about five minutes uh, about Nea's question. And, and first, a bit of background on, on the program that I lead, the Gender Equity and Governance Program. So, so we have um, five strategies that we uh, implement and that we manage a budget of about $110 million a year spread across those five strategies. About 40 million of that per year is focused on reproductive health and reproductive rights in the US and, and internationally. And over the last year and a half, we've done three refreshes of those five strategies. I, I came from the Gates Foundation before Hewlett. And so I left the Gates Foundation partially because I was kind of tired of doing strategies. And here I am doing three new strategies at Hewlett. Um, it, it wasn't because I love strategies. It's because I, um, it was time at Hewlett. We uh, take a look backwards. We take a look uh, outwards. We take a look forward every five or six years in our strategies. And so three of the five strategies needed a, a refresh. So it was just time. I, I think in, in terms of global health and the areas that we work, you know, the, the, these refreshes were um, looking at and quite proud of contributing to um, so many successes uh, and successes across global health that all of you have also contributed to and certainly led you know around malaria around art around family planning and safe abortion around childhood vaccines in the governance space transparency and participation um, and open government are become a norm become an aspiration for so many governments so so we felt like there's uh, been a lot of progress but um, we felt like it was time for a change in, in our theory of change. Um, and that change is really centered on one issue, which is to, to increase domestic pressure on governments to um, do the right thing, to adopt better policies, to implement better policies, to budget for uh, better policies. Uh, uh, it was The feeling was our previous theories of change had been really very tech technocratic, focused a lot on aid effectiveness, focused on getting governments to commit at global conferences, to, to change policies, uh, focused on peer pressure, a more global to country approach. And um, while this contributed to a lot of the successes that I just mentioned a second ago, um, we felt like there's this huge implementation gap in, in governments and, and, and what they aspired or said they would do versus what they were doing. And, and so we thought we wanted to flip this to make it much more community and country driven and not so much supply or, or donor driven. So that I think coupled with this issue of, of increasing inequities between countries and within countries 
became the focus of, of our newly branded name of our program, Gender Equity and Governance, but also the these three refreshes. And, and so there was three cross-cutting themes that kind of emerged as a result of this new why, this new theory of change. We um, aspire to move more money to organizations headquartered in the global south. Um, historically, about three quarters of our budgets went to INGOs in the global north. Now it's about two thirds. We will continue to see that trend move. We don't have a target, um, but we do want to keep on um, that trend. Uh, the moving, we're going to start to fund and increasingly fund feminist movements and women's rights organizations, um, and then um, continue to fund and expand our funding in, in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, uh, and to that end, we provide significant funding to INGOs to look at their DEIJ, but also we're going to have a convening in September. So amongst a whole bunch of Global South grantees and partners to, to ask them and learn from them about how they define DEIJ, because the things that we talk about, racial justice, for example, don't always um, matter or are framed differently in, in the Global South. Um, I'll just say a couple more things. We're really worried about the potential fit pitfalls, however, of this new theory of change, new strategy, new strategies, because one could replace one power dynamic, a north-south power dynamic, with a different um, and unhealthy power dynamic of, of, of elite capture of our funding in the global south, or um, a capture by an ethnic group over one ethnic group. So there's, there's, there's a pitfall that we have to be aware of, and we count on partners to help us um, manage. I, I actually don't like a lot of the polemic and a lot of the conversation around decolonizing because it sometimes is meant to imply that INGO bad and local good and and maybe I'm just validating my own experience having worked in for 25 years in, in INGOs but um, I just think INGOs have access to capital and human resources and innovations that local organizations don't have and so uh, that we really need both and I think that would probably be the last thing I'd say is it's um, I don't think so much about power shifting and I, I think I would rewrite the blog to get rid of power shifting and more like power enhancing because we don't want to take power from INGOs and give that or move that or incent that to, to the global south. We actually want more power for INGOs and more power for, for uh, local NGOs and CBOs um, so that one plus one equals three, not um, one plus one equals one or, 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 or zero sum game. So. Um, all of this move of the funding and increasingly funding women's rights organizations and feminist movements um, is really not to signal uh, that we are virtuous, but it really is meant to, to achieve goals, to contribute to goals, to get results, um, because uh, results still really matter in, in this work. That's why we're in this work, uh, not just a virtue signal, but to um, really accelerate and sustain um, better results at the, at the front lines. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dana. And I, I think, you know, you you bring up a lot of good, um, you know, topics for consideration in terms of what we call it and how we do it will really matter. Um, Shannon, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, you know, in a very similar vein, I think the Gates Foundation is similarly thinking about its grant making and any strategic shifts it needs to make to kind of be relevant in, in a very changing uh, space. And so if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'd love to learn a little bit more about BMGF's priorities and any new strategies you have in place to evolve with this sector. Sure, thanks so much. And I'm also likewise sorry I can't be there today. Um, like Dana said, we have probably a strategy for every person in the foundation. We have a lot of teams, very complex organization, but what we really have coalesced around is number one, our commitment to gender equality as exemplified by um, a new division that was uh, developed uh, about two years ago. Also, we have a very strong commitment to DEI and thinking through what that means, not just internally, but also for our grant making. So for my team, I work on the development policy and finance team within the gender or the <laughs> global policy and advocacy division. And for us working in health financing, we are really um, strengthening some regional institutions. The foundation's been doing that for a long time, but there happens to be some opportunities within the African Union. Most of the, what I'm going to say today is, is based in Sub-Saharan Africa, but of course we have uh, similar strategies also in um, South Asia and uh, other countries as well. So um, 
one of the things that we have really noticed um, with COVID as, as both an opportunity and really an exciting um, development is the strength of the African Union as a voice for the continent and the ability to bring together diverse voices within the continent. Um, they've recently launched, um, the Africa CDC has launched a health economics program, which we are supporting. Um, and also there's the African Leadership Meeting for Investing in Health. And that is an initiative of the African Union to um, enable and, and foster uh, sustainable financing uh, for health systems. And what we've noticed in addition to, you know, to the strong um, uh, institutions that have been built, AMRAF, AARC, AFHIA, and others, is that there really is the um, ability uh, on the continent to provide technical support to countries um, to also think through what are current capacity gaps in health financing and health economics, and also, you know, what will be anticipated in the future, and to really lead that conversation. And then, the, of course, there's the accountability mechanism as well as countries are reporting out their progress in health financing to the Africa Union. Um, and we're also, other teams are supporting uh, donor alignment platforms, which are amplifying country voices as they uh, work with donors, as they try to equalize the relationships, as they um, work to defragment the highly fragmented financing, and also to think through what transparency looks like. As we know, a lot of funding goes off budget and countries don't often know exactly um, what is being spent in their country, which makes planning and um, budgeting very, very difficult. And so as we're thinking through these dynamics, then, you know, the question is, did COVID provide an opportunity to think about our TA models differently? Is there a way, for example, to provide a pooled fund for technical assistance that enables countries to perhaps buy the technical assistance that they want to draw down from this fund, have some quality assurance around that? I don't know where we're going to end on that, but that's kind of where we're thinking. We're also thinking uh, about um, opportunities in digital, of course. We wouldn't be the Gates Foundation if we weren't doing that. Um, my team is thinking about uh, digital and uh, public financial management and the accountability and also governance structures that underlie that. Many other teams are thinking about amplifying digital in um, service delivery. Um, and then one of the, the deep things, you know, uh, Dana reflected as well is thinking about the power dynamic, not just as uh, the grantor and the grantee relationship, but also in these relationships that we have set up between uh, grantees and sub awardees. And thinking through, you know, is there a northern institution that's providing, you know, that's a sub award to a typically southern institution and how do we equalize that. So some of the program officers are actually doing dual awards now and um, developing joint accountability frameworks, for example, to try to um, equalize that relationship a little bit and then thinking, you know, as a program officer then what are some of the unintended consequences that we might be setting up as we um, uh, uh, support partners to work with countries um, to you know, move in X, Y, or Z direction? Well, if you multiply that by 10 program officers and you know, five strategies and then you know, 20 partners, then you have a cacophony of voices um, in, in the country, and it may not be enabling the country ownership and country voice that we are expecting. And so now, you know, the big question that comes up for leadership is what happens when country decision making really is not always in line with what donors want? That is a, a, a question that is above my pay grade, but I think it's going to be something that we're going to be tackling as well um, as we really uh, do see uh, leadership within the regional institutions. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and hand it back to you. Thanks so much. Just to change it up, I'm gonna take it from here now. Um, so Oliver, and thank you so much. That was really useful and 
also just very interesting that both Shannon and, and Dana mentioned the need for diligence and really being careful about the unintended consequences that may come from these shifts in strategies. Um, I'd like to shift over to Oliver now. Um, in many ways, your career has spanned many sectors and industries and geographies, not unlike some of our Bay Area Global Health Alliance members. Given your diverse experience, what additional trends or observations about global health financing would you like to share with us? Thank you. And hi to Shannon and Dana. We've all crossed paths many times. It's good to see you both. Um, I am now uh, a, a sort of portfolio manager, managing director, leader at um, the DRK Foundation. So we're, we're a very small foundation. We do sort of startup grants to early stage organizations and companies. Um, solving big social problems. So I think, you know, we're not necessarily the right funder for a PSI or a PATH, but hopefully I can give you a sense of, of, of sort of what I'm seeing or what I'm thinking about from my perspective. Um, I thought, uh, you know, it's funny, picking up on something Dana said, I do, you know, I think there's, there's, there's definitely, a, a, you know, important to be really nuanced about what we mean by international NGOs and national NGOs and um, make sure we're not it's not a sort of zero sum game, but I do think the reality is we're going to see, and we already are seeing power and money shifting away from San Francisco and Seattle and, and into places where, where um, it hasn't been in the past. And I think that's true on the, you know, definitely on the grantee side, but I think it's true on the grantor side as well. I think um, we are one of our neighbors, uh, Mackenzie Scott, I think has been sort of my inspiration there. I've watched her you know, give away $12 billion in, you know, 18 months with zero full-time staff and, you know, a few consultants. And, you know, in her, in her sort of letters as she gives these away, I think she points a finger at, you know, donors who, you know, I think all of us who sort of have this instinct to, 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 to keep resources and power close. Um, and what does it look like to decolonize or what does it look like to redistribute that in a meaningful way? Um, so that's been on my mind a lot. And, and, you know, a lot of the investments we make are in, you know, organizations that are based in the global south that are led by, you know, folks who are proximal to these problems. Um, and the, the flip side of that is sort of what, what should we as many, you know, many of us as sort of global actors and uh, grant makers or nonprofits or startups of one kind or another, where should we focus? and um, if we're going to be relinquishing some of that control, some of that power, some of that decision making. Um, so what I, you know, what I think about, and I've been coaching a lot of folks uh, in, in sort of my portfolio on this, is where, how can we get really specific and narrow about where there is a real value add to have an international, or to have a sort of global grant maker writing a detailed strategy, you know, if, if I'm a grant maker, how do I justify not being Mackenzie Scott? How do I justify, you know, having a big team and making strategy? You know, being really, really precise and concrete about about what problem I want to solve. And then as a grantee, um, which I again I've been many times, um, how do I get really specific and concrete about what what are the problems I'm going to solve? What am I going to deliver and then be done? You know, so there's a there's a grant I'm working on right now, which I think you know has been which is um, which is to an international NGO, um, and uh, and and they're looking at how to uh, address lead poisoning globally. I this is like all new for me, and I'm probably I think the data is still coming out. But you know, a third of all kids in the entire world have toxic levels of lead. It kills a million people. You know, potentially double malaria. It's it's this huge huge problem. And there's a group of international actors who have said, look. For, for 20 million bucks, maybe it'll cost double that for $40 million. Um, we can go country by country to the 100 countries that don't have lead paint laws, pass lead paint laws, and then work with those paint industries to reformulate um, what they're producing. And in five or seven years, maybe it takes 10, there's always these proposals on That problem is done. And these organizations are done, and they're, you know, the, they're working on them. are going to go work on a different problem. And I think that's a really compelling for as a as a donor now thinking with this lens of of how do we you know where 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 do we feel good about funding um, international organizations? I think that's a really compelling pitch on 
how do we frame our work as really that narrow and specific? Like, what is the problem we're going to solve in the next five years that we're really uniquely set up to solve? And then what are all the things we're not going to do? What are all the trainings and, you know, capacity building that maybe can be better done? And on the foundation side, where are the Um, yeah, so that's really what's been on my mind as, as, as I think about these. Thanks, Oliver. I think uh, that's going to be my new question every morning. How can I be a bit more like Mackenzie Scott? <laughs> good, good question. No, but it, it kind of ties back to, you know, the values and who do we want to be both as grantees and grant makers. Um, I think it's, it's really valuable. Um, before we turn it over to audience Q&A, I just had one more question, and it's for all the panelists, actually. Um, I think Amy Lynn talked a little bit about strategic risk making, and I'd love to hear maybe one or two things that each of you are doing within your respective organizations that you think is a bit innovative or a bit riskier than what you would normally do, or if that's too difficult, just anything that is really kind of powering you through the year and through COVID and makes you really excited about your work. So anyone who wants, who wants to take that question on, feel free. Jen, and your, your uh, image came up in our room, so I'll put you on the spot and you can go first. Yes, so um, I may get in trouble for saying this, but I am taking this opportunity to really challenge our leadership. So, you know, if we are serious about the work that we're doing, then um, we have to be very humble at how many mistakes we have made in a, uh, let's call it the traditional model mm -hmm. of grant making, and to really understand that there are going to be mistakes as we kind of shift these power dynamics. And it is a learning curve and we should have that. <laughs> Maybe I'm creating space for myself to not you know, get in trouble for making a mistake in a grant or something. But I think we have to really bring some humility to this process and understand that there's going to be, you know, our partners uh, in country, the regional institutions, they are not going to get it perfect every time. And um, not that we need to relax our focus on, um, on outputs and, and, and really great um, work, but to understand that we're going to have, we're going to make mistakes and to be ready for that. So yeah, over to you. Thanks, Shannon. Anyone else? Oliver, sure. Dana? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say, so, and this goes to a, a question that I think Obed asked in the, in the chat around our grant making practices. Uh, typically about two thirds of our funding at the Hewlett Foundation across the foundation is general operating support or unrestricted program support, a program at part of a large institution and unrestricted within that program. Something we're very proud about. The, the thing that's kind of uh, a bit of a bummer though is that uh, that we don't give a lot of unrestricted support to organizations headquartered in the Global South. Uh, it's much more project-based and much more short-term. The grants are smaller, the grants are shorter, and the grants are restricted. And so we're really pushing the envelope on that. And I think we're also revising our proposal template on reporting requirements because we want to be, you know, with, with a capital I inclusiveness uh, featured. So um, can we accept proposals that are just like three-minute videos or a 10-minute video? Can we uh, accept proposals Proposals in different languages besides English um, and just um, uh, auto translate those. Uh, we're really trying to push this inclusion barrier that has kind of hobbled us in, in some of our grant making, um, um, some unconscious biases we might have had. Thanks. That's really great. Oliver, anything to add there? Um, I, hmm. I would say one thing that's getting me, one thing that's gotten me really excited in the past. Uh, few months. I spent the morning at a board meeting of, of a U.S.-based organization. Um, but what's gotten me excited is the chance to find creative ways and innovations to, um, you know, push push resources out of big systems and into the hands of, you know, individual sort of recipients. Um, I spent the morning on a call, which, uh, which, which for me with a with a portfolio organization, a tech company here in the US, um, who essentially goes to insurance companies, has a product where they 
you know, essentially take two or three thousand dollars from the insurance company and give it in cash to the or or in a debit person who's a uh, often experiencing homelessness, someone who's a really high utilizer of, of ED. Um, and just the eye opening, uh, the eye opening conversations with these insurance companies where you're where you show them the results of you give someone dollars a month, which in the health in the U.S. healthcare industry you can buy like one band aid in a hospital for dollars. And and showing you know that that impact um, dramatically reducing, et cetera. Um, and also just the fact that they, that that giving someone money directly often outperforms. That's been sort of that's what's in my mind today as a as. A, as That's really that's really interesting. And there's a lot of data these days around direct giving and how impactful it is. So thanks for bringing that up. We are going to open it up for audience Q and A. Yeah, and we have one from the online community. So maybe we should start there, and then I'll take this around the audience. So this one is a little bit. Um, this one is from, from our board member, Permina Maine, who asked decolonization, diversity, equity, and inclusion are the major themes of our discussion these days and development. In your view, how can the Alliance concretely come together as partners to make a true difference to push this agenda forward? And to our funders and speakers um, who have joined us today, to be fair, like how can we partner with you all to do the good work that you're doing is probably the way we would phrase it. And then it's a good question for us as an alliance to also think about. But for that, I'll just open it up to Oliver or Dana or Sh Shannon to um, answer that question. jump in and uh, and just say quickly, I, I, I wish I had a sort of a magic wand for this question. I, I, I think it's a bit more pedestrian what I'm going to say than that. But as I used to run an organization and uh, and boards have a certain way that they manage CEOs and performance manage CEOs. You know, it's around turnover. It's around service uh, statistics. It's around these sort of aggregate measures. Um, a lot of them lead to fundraising and more and more, more staff, more funds. And I think that that this Bay Area Alliance could really um, think collectively about how to educate boards and how to bring on board members who define a leadership performance metrics a bit differently so that it's really about partnerships and really about the field that you're part of and how do you build fields and things like that and that is not easy but it, but it but i think we need to replace the performance management metrics of, of ceos and executive directors with something else which is a bit more sort of field level and the second thing i'll say real quickly is is this is easy to say and harder to do but but we really like it when partnerships are created and there's a Global South organization that comes as a lead or an equal partner with uh, the, the Bay Area organization or a, a Global North organization. When that is palpably a partnership, um, that, uh, that, that counts um, rather than just uh, prime and sub. Yeah, and I would say something I've been thinking about is um, the Harvard Business School case study. Uh, if anyone's familiar with that, it's a great learning tool where you really dive into a case and start to understand some of the business model and the cases around that. And I feel like we need a global health uh, version of that to help us understand the um, these unintended consequences that we've talked about to really start to unpack the power dynamics and um, the business model that we've been working with so that I think it was Dana that said so that we aren't recreating or, you know, uh, developing a, a system that um, is also uh, un unequal and has, you know, and is not fostering inclusion. And so I'd love to think it through some partnership around that. Um, if anyone's willing, send me a message. <laughs> I would just one thing Dana said really resonated with me um, that I think this is an incredible brain trust and and group of thought partners 
Yeah, to think about, and I think it's it's you know board performance metrics is one version of it, but another another maybe version of it is um, what are how do we as a global community you know think creatively about um, what success looks like? And I think that the the most common reason we say no to to, to startups or organizations who come to us is that it's it's sort of transparent that the organization is is. Uh, is pitching to us because they want to grow, because they want more resources, more staff, more power, more, you know, whatever it is. And I think all of us, you know, we're sitting in, in San Francisco with the, you know, the home of the venture capital industry. And like, I think success is, is defining success is, is as growth and reach and influence in this space is, 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 um, particularly dangerous, and and I think goes against where where the money is going to be in the future, and where the attention and is going to be in the future. So I think you guys have a, a really unique, you know, opportunity to think together about about that question, and and that rooting it in concrete metrics, rooting it in how you talk to funders, rooting it in how you set your own organizational strategies to really, you know, are there organizations that shouldn't, you know organization should be around for just five years to get all the lead paint laws passed and then be done and um and 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 sort of holding each other accountable being a being a group i'll also say we're always looking for young growing organizations to fund so i think during this thought process as you guys come out with new ideas i would love to hear them all thank you so much any questions from the audience I ask that you please introduce yourself and if your question is directed at an individual panelist, just let them know. Steph, go for it. They say never start with an apology, but I, I'd like to ask a selfish question and ask for advice. Um, the original, or the, so the father of these alliances was the Washington Global Health Alliance, and it was founded with a lot of support from philanthropy, mostly the Gates Foundation, and brought together the community in Washington State here, the need is much greater because we don't have a dominant foundation. We don't have a dominant university. We don't have a dominant NGO. We're much more fragmented, and yet we have much more capacity. So I think the value proposition is much greater. We've had very generous support from quite a bit of private industry that's here, and I'm very grateful for it. We've been spectacularly unsuccessful at getting support from private philanthropy for this effort. Why do you think that is? Is it because we're now in a new time, or are we not conveying a value proposition properly. What is your advice for engaging the philanthropic sector in this enterprise? Sorry to put people on the spot. <laughs> we like to ask hard questions here, so. Uh, are you really sorry, Steph? <laughs> I just had lunch with Steph a month ago and uh, he didn't ask me this, um, but I think it's a great question. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll start. First of all, our, our um, grant making in health is relatively small, as I'd said, as a proportion of our overall budget. So this is a global health alliance. So that, that's one thing. I, I will ag agree certainly with Steph, and I've said this to Lisa and others, that, that the need is, is greater here than in Washington because there is a lot of incredible amount of capacity and there's no gravity. There's no one um, um, sort of gravitational force around which everybody else can sort of circulate. Um, I, I think it goes back to this issue of, of where do we want to build capacity and where do we want to um, uh, harness energy? And if there were more sort of Southern connections of this group that were um, clear, I think there would be more interest maybe from at least us. Uh, um, right now it feels very um, Northern and um, Silicon Valley focused, which I understand it's reason to be and, and Steph is 100% right. But but I don't know, that, that's just my um, throwback to Steph and y'all. I have another question. I'd like to throw that back to you. Um, I'm Michelle Berry, Dean of Global Health. Um, it, we are at Stanford, sorry. <laughs> sorry, only Stanford. Um, I, I, but, you know, you're right about the fact that we're um, Silicon Valley tech oriented uh, with some academia um, pushed in. Um, but it seems to me that philanthropy is often vertically transmitted. Um, they often do not give money to the global south 
alone. I, I'd, I'd love to know whether you guys are doing that. And one of the, we've talked about human-centered need and decolonization, um, but what if you thought about actually taking partners from the Global South and offering them partners in the Bay Area so that there are actually problems that are needed there, because it really should be their problems, not our problems or our agenda, um, and being somewhat of a matchmaker. I mean, you have a lot of talent in this room, um, and we're crossing many different sectors. I can't make eye contact with anyone. And we're crossing many different sectors. Um, and, and I really think it's an untapped um, resource for philanthropy. Um, so I, I throw that out to you. It sort of builds upon Steph's question. You know, I would just say I, this is maybe a narrow view. I was involved a little bit with the Washington. I was when I was at uh, I was at Bill Gates's office, not the Gates Foundation, but partnering closely. You know, I think the 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 Washington Global Health Alliance had a very clear when, when I engaged with them, had a very clear value proposition. I think number one for me, it was hiring. It was as we tried to build teams, this was a pool of talent that we could bring in, and that was really powerful and compelling. And I don't know to what extent you guys have made that specific case. That was alone a great reason. I do think second, I do think Gates in a way that some Silicon Valley, I don't, you know, I don't know the philanthropy space here as well, but some Gates is locally focused and cares about building community within Seattle in a way that I don't, I just don't know which is the global health philanthropy here that is place-based, that is also has a local program and also has a deep commitment here. And I do think a third piece is the landscape does is changing a little bit, and 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 the decolonization is one piece. I think another another thing I see when I engage with folks in philanthropy here is the you know effective altruism movement and the you know give wells and give directly and sort of that lens is 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 new and different. And 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 if that's a big chunk of philanthropy, how do you engage and what's the value proposition and what's the participation in that community? Um, so those are some those are some thoughts off the top of my head about about. Okay, we give very small grants to new startups, so it's not it's not necessarily a fit for us, but um, that's how I might think about it. Value proposition, philanthropies who are place based, and then how do, how are you guys reflecting and thinking about those trends and trends, especially here? In, in, in... And I might jump in to add and say. Um, in health financing, as the foundation, we believe you know government should take the uh, primary responsibility for health financing. And at the same time, there is a, a real craving for private sector engagement, at least through the African leadership meeting, through the AU and um, other entities, the regional partnerships that we were talking about. And we really haven't kind of landed that within the foundation. I think that's very fair to say, kind of where both our viewpoint is on private sector engagement in the, um, the private sector role, not like we would decide, but how we are thinking about um, uh, that engagement and how we might um, be supporting countries to amplify that. There's you know, some countries that have um, been more aggressive and assertive in, in building that um, those partnerships, uh, Kenya being one of them, and other countries are trying to seek and think through what the opportunity space is. Um, and I'm talking beyond health insurance, you know, private, there's also private sector delivery, but really thinking about um, what are the opportunities to partner to improve um, uh, the health financing infrastructure or governance structures or um, uh, other spaces. So I don't know where we're going on that, but I could just say that that, that might be um, uh, you know, one area for the Health Alliance to, to consider. Over. Dana, anything to add? Otherwise, happy to take on another question from the audience. Nope, nothing for me. And Mary Pittman from the Public Health Institute. I'm just going to take Shannon's comments a little bit further. I know we've done work in India with the um, 
the Melinda Gates Foundation, and you were really trying to shift, I think, a lot of the grant to your local India state's office. And I'm wondering, how does that work? Is that something you're planning on doing in, you know, in the rest of the world? Are you actually starting to shift not only where the dollars go, but the decision-making about those dollars to country? Great question and very timely. Uh, yes, we just announced in April uh, another reorganization that was fairly fundamental in um, uh, enabling health de uh, delivery programs and um, pushing more responsibility and resourcing uh, towards the um, country and regional offices. So I think that is yes. And I think um, there we also acknowledge that it will be a process. It's not going to happen overnight, but um, certainly that process has, has definitely started. Have time for maybe two more questions online so maybe this could be the final one here and I've got one online too okay. hello I'm Diane Dodge I'm with the Tiba Foundation we're partners with Mahdi Babu Foundation in Kenya and um, I'm just interested to hear more about the women's empowerment initiatives that each one of you guys are doing thank you Yeah, yeah, I'll start. So it, it covers all of our strategies. We have a women's economic empowerment strategy. It's about $20 million a year. That's really focused on, on macroeconomic policies and, and decision making. There, there, we feel like there's been increasing amount of investment and rightly so, and more needs to happen in terms of uh, financial inclusion, women's entrepreneurship, self-help groups, um, those sorts of things. And, but um, what where there's been very little investment is on um, on how tax or budget or other sorts of macro levers impact and enable or disable women's economic um, uh, choices and opportunities. So th that's our women's economic empowerment strategy. I, like I said in my opening remarks that w working, we're going to be spending about $50 million a year on feminist movements and women's rights organizations. Um, and that's also part of our inclusive governance strategy to 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 make sure or help to so the governments are more responsive to to the issues that women and girls um, articulate um, for themselves. And I would add to what Dana said, our team is just starting to think through the gendered implications of macro policies. Um, that's probably going to be a growing area. And then within our gender division, we uh, just had um, uh, part of the announcements of some of the changes was our family planning and our MNCH teams um, moved under our gender equality division to enable sort of a line of sight um, directly from the, the diagnostics uh, and discovery work that we do all the way to delivery uh, for women's health issues. And um, so specifically on the health side and then uh, the women's economic empowerment is a big uh, piece of work as well as the care agenda, thinking through that. And then as part of the theory of change, there's also a women in leadership initiative, um, thinking through um, the uh, opportunity space to amplify women's voices in um, health, law, and um, economics. And that work is, is, is just kicking off, but it has been resourced. And uh, we have made a fairly large investment um, th through co-impact to develop some of those uh, venture type um, uh, grants and grant making to enable some uh, new institutions. So co-impact has, has been a great partner in that work. I'll just say we don't, we don't have a formal strategy in any space, including women's health, but um, I've actually been working with, I've just said hi to Mark over here, at, uh, Mark from others. Um, I've been looking looking very hard to find the right set of uh, organizations working on maternal mortality, both in the US and, and abroad. Um, so really excited to learn more about what you guys are doing and, and if, there's, um, if there are others who are working in that space, it's something. And thank you. We have one final question um, from online from our Zoom audience, and it's from Jessica Kim, who is an MBA PH, MPH student from UC Berkeley. And she asked, um, 
I have I see a similar priority in finance in the financing shift towards the global south and human centered design and empowering the local decision makers and communities. Could any of the panelists speak to trends that harness these synergies and shared alignment? I mean, I would I, I, one thing I would say that um, has been really powerful for me about this new role where I'm doing a mix of you know philanthropy but also venture investing uh, is um, the focus how important when when you look at something from as a as a venture investor um, how important that focus on the customer is. Um, how important, and I think human-centered design is sort of one lens there. Um, but uh, so, so a lot of the, I think, in 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 with a purely philanthropic approach, it's easy. I think Shannon, you know, Shannon said it's easy for you know as a donor to have a very different perspective than a government or than a population. Um, but I think it's been really powerful for me to shift shift that perspective to you know, if this is going to be sustainable. You know, consumers actually, it has to actually meet a need of consumers. So I think that's a powerful lens there and something that I've definitely taken forward, even back to my sort of nonprofit um, grant making. I think, I think Neha mentioned this as well. I think I've been uh, reading in, you know, interested to read both in the US and abroad um, just the effectiveness of some of the conditional and unconditional cash transfer experiments that have been going on. So that's that definitely, or as, as a, opportunity. Some of the work that I think it was even Dana's team kicked off uh, a while ago on human-centered design really played um, uh, front and center in the development of the uh, primary health care strategy. And I think we've seen that definitely in the latest um, Lancet Commission report. I think there is a focus you know, unfortunately, out-of-pocket payments still make up a large proportion um, of health financing. Um, however, that's also um, something that we can look at as the consumers, what are they getting for those dollars? And um, so the team has been able to kind of flip that in thinking about what are the service delivery models that enable, you know, foundational uh, uh, financing to flow to health facilities and actually get the recourse and the feedback loops on what's working and not working. So I think um, it's it's definitely an evolving area that is really important. The bank has picked this up and um, I think we're just going to see more and more uh, both research and also uh, government buy-in. So I wanna just thank our three panelists again. Thank you for joining both in person and virtually. It was a really great conversation and I think we all enjoyed it. I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much and thank you so much for being with us, Oliver, and for Dana and Shannon for joining us online and for Neha for managing this awkwardness of, of a hybrid and people here and people there. So thank you so much. We have another, um, if we can take another like six, seven minute break and continue to do your sticky work and also um, get to know each other, that would be fabulous. And we'll come back here and for the last session. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, being here with us today. It's so wonderful to have everyone here. It's a different kind of situation. I think we're all kind of feeling, I know this is one of my few meetings that I've had um, in person in about two, three years, um, almost three years, I guess now. So since the pan pandemic began and it's, it's, it's odd. And, but it's so wonderful to see everyone and it's so nice to have everyone together. So thank you so much. I just wanted to introduce a little bit of, um, about the state of the Alliance um, and then introduce some key partnerships because that's what we're really all about. So we are now, as I said earlier, more than 60 members. We are represented in this meeting by more than 40 of those members and several members have lots of people here. So we're under 100 people today, but um, we just think that that's wonderful start. It looks like every time I get up here, there are many more of the post-its up there. So that's really great to see where we might 
collaborate and work together. And I hope to, to see more there. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is just kind of how this group, everyone in this room and our board members and our staff, and I can't go without thanking Madhavi and Marion and Abby, who's on the line, and Lisa, who will join us back in the fall. Um, we couldn't do this without them and that support. It's been amazing. And we've really been able to leverage and strengthen the innovation ethos in this, in this region, but also very much beyond it. And I say beyond because we have become more than a Bay Area community. We do want to be a Bay Area community, but the first two members of 2022 this year are organizations, one that's based in Guatemala and one that's based in Kenya. The Bay Area Global Health Alliance and its founders were wise from the very beginning to harness the talent and know-how from all corners. And what's really common between us all is this dedication to global health equity and impact. And that's so apparent in every conversation I have with all of you. We spend a lot of our time with matchmaking and just one-on-one -on -one meetings, getting to know you, getting to know your work, and we want to do more of that. We found that there are certain kind of synergies that are happening, and in some of those synergies, I want to tell you a little bit about some key partnerships that we've already had. So I'm going to leave the podium, but I want to um, turn it over to some of my colleagues. And for the first one is the Alliance for Advancing Health Online is one of our key partnerships. And we have Mark Allen from Merck for Mothers to talk about that today. Uh, so Nisha was actually supposed to prepare our marks, um, but unfortunately we know she's uh, recuperating. Um, so uh, Mark Allen, I'm with uh, Merck from Others, but I also wear another hat. Um, as a public professional who is um, sort of sitting at home in my apartment in New York City, uh, going a little stir crazy, wanting to try to do something around the COVID uh, crisis, um, obviously we were doing a lot of work within maternal health, but also I raised my hand as a gig assignment, which sounded really fun at the time, but ended up becoming a full-time job in addition to my responsibilities with Merck from others with our vaccine competence team. And that was um, really to help stand up this alliance um, called the Alliance for Advancing Health Online. Um, I can't take credit for it. Um, actually, Meta and Praveen, who uh, is a, a board member, was uh, shopping around and tried to courting other partners to join uh, what was an idea at the time around um, allocating resources to really support uh, research around how to use and harness social technology uh, to really help um, create better trust and better health literacy around issues. And at the time, obviously the burning platform was around uh, uh, COVID-19 and vaccine hesitancy. And so uh, we joined forces with Meta uh, last year. Um, and um, when we were joining this alliance, um, both uh, Merck obviously was recognizing vaccine hesitancy was a real issue. Um, obviously with COVID, but also with routine immunizations. Uh, and it was a very high priority. And, and Meta, um, obviously aware of the, uh, the infodemic and just the reach of their platforms and how much information was circulating, uh, both good and bad, wanted to do something very quickly. And so um, in the spirit of uh, moving quickly, we kind of moved a little bit alone uh, to stand up uh, the first initiative we call the Vaccine Confidence Fund, uh, which we, we launched in June of last year. Uh, we've deployed um, around $7 million across 33 uh, global uh, enterprises to really help understand how to use social technologies to address vaccine hesitancy. Uh, a majority of that was around COVID-19, but also around routine immunization. Um, one of the objectives um, was obviously to try to support novel research. We, this was a gap. Um, and if uh, those that are kind of in the public health space recognize that the capacity and the understanding of really using social technology uh, to drive um, influence and offline behavior is something uh, still relatively um, unmet in terms of a body of research. And so uh, one of our uh, objectives was to just sort of uh, help to fund and fill that gap. Uh, a second objective also was around dissemination. So when we were doing the due diligence to get the approval for uh, Merck's $20 million commitment to match with Meta's, um, we recognize that a lot of the research was sort of happening within the bilateral walls of whether it be uh, meta working with researchers or multilaterals working with different researchers. 
but that information wasn't getting to actual practitioners as a public good to be able to be used. Um, and so one of the objectives of the Alliance um, is around dissemination. Uh, and that's where we came uh, to the, uh, the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. It helped when you had two board members that sat on the, uh, on the Alliance. But when we were looking at um, how do we get this information out there, uh, we actually choose, we chose two partners through a competitive process. One was the Save-In Vaccine Institute. Uh, they have a really networked community called their Boost Community uh, globally, where we thought there was an, um, an activated audience for a lot of this research. But we also recognized that there was a need uh, more broadly and a different set of audience uh, and reach, which is where the Bay Area Global Health Alliance uh, played that role. And so uh, we've worked with Sarah and the team. Um, they also raised their hand thinking this would be um, a fun opportunity. And I think it was a little bit more work than I think both Sarah and I uh, bargained for. But uh, we have Dax Up, which is a, a podcast um, that we now have um, six episodes and have two more in, in the pipeline which really kind of um, interrogate a case study around how organizations locally have used social technology, social media to really influence and build trust around vaccine confidence, um, and also to try to translate that to um, increased vaccination uptake. Uh, and so um, the Alliance will continue. Uh, we are launching another um, uh, RFP next week at the World Health Assembly, as well as releasing a preliminary insights report from the 33 research grants. Um, that final report will come out in, in July, and we'll be doing uh, a co-event um, with Sabin and Bay Area to help uh, disseminate that information. But um, so here, one, to, to plug um, Sarah and the team for really helping uh, on that dissemination objective, and we're going to continue to see how we might want to move forward. And then also, um, anybody that might be interested that sort of understands this intersection around how you use these uh, far-reaching platforms to help um, drive uh, better offline health behavior and help build that trust, which we know is, uh, is challenging. I'm certainly happy to, um, you know, have any conversations sort of post uh, the event. So thanks. Thank you, Mark. It's been a joy working with, with you and the, the Alliance. It's really been fun. I still think you should change it to a coalition though, so we don't, we can still be the Alliance. Um, our next guest is also named Mark. Um, it's Mark Lagan, and he is from Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. He is joining us online from Washington, D.C. And back in the end of the year of 2021, Mark and I started thinking about what can we do together, and we came up with a private web dialogue dialogue with the tech sector, looking at leveraging digital technology to improve health systems and equity worldwide. It was a wonderful partnership putting that event together, and Mark has some things to tell you about it and a report that's coming out tomorrow. Mark, over to you. Thanks a lot, Sarah, and it's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, TB, and Malaria is an advocate for the work of the Global Fund, but more generally for uh, access to health care um, for marginalized populations as pandemics arise and more generally um, for universal health coverage. Um, this uh, dialogue we had in late January was uh, super. I, I, I was surprised to see just how frank and how uh, gritty it was, and it's informed a report that um, we've put together, we're putting out uh, tomorrow, so you get, get the preview, and perhaps uh, if uh, you see, the, see it online and you, you think it's uh, worthwhile, um, love it if you would um, disseminate it and do social, but um, the, the ba if you might advance the slide, if you would. Um, the basic premises of the report um, are that technology can be leveraged um, for health, but it should be should focus on public health systems, not be detached from public health systems, but improve them markedly um, as they need. Um, secondly, uh, putting people at the center of innovations or human-centered design. Um, and then thirdly, um, there are kind of policy and moral um, imperatives to ensure that there's equity of access for all groups. 
and uh, that privacy and individual rights are um, protected at the same time as data is properly collected for surveillance and care. So the basic recommendations of the report are these. Um, opportunities to go farther in streamlining electronic health records, particularly in a number of, of countries of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Global South, um, that there's still much to be done for harnessing mobile phone technology um, at the same time as maintaining privacy. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll point out a related one, which is building digital literacy and what we might call digital comfort. Um, for, for citizens, for um, marginalized groups, uh, for those who don't have um, great access to a health system, uh, to feel comfortable taking fullest advantage um, of digital technology, sharing their data, benefiting from data. Um, a, a fourth uh, conclusion of several is that clinical service delivery and e-health can really be um, driven forward um, if there's the right kind of strategic dialogue between um, innovators, uh, community, and um, the public sector. Um, there's really important roles to be played by citizens and civil society in monitoring clinical health services led by communities, and that's something that can be done uh, with and on digital platforms. Uh, data is essential for mapping where health delivery and equity vary, filling gaps, improving imbalances. Social media, as many of you have been thinking about, are essential for sharing verified sound information for health, since, of course, platforms um, in the digital world have been a, a place for uh, myths um, to, to be disseminated, something um, Andy Pattison and others have been grappling with. And then finally, um, building the technological infrastructure for future developments, having a, a structure where you can um, move innovation out to deployment. And here, um, on a number of these things, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria is a multi-stakeholder partnership of governments, private sector, uh, civil society organizations, um, has 20 years of experience and is a partner um, that can, can help in moving innovation um, to the ground and to benefit remote places uh, and disadvantaged populations and the other part of its uh, multi-stakeholder um, partnership, the civil society part, is a way for the private sector and innovators, researchers, business, um, to have the sense that um, people are, uh, you know, the user uh, is, is getting what they need and is part uh, of the design and implementation. Thank you, sir. We really value our, our partnership with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance and our, our membership in it. And we'd like to thank Chevron for its support in making this report possible. Thank you, Mark. It was wonderful having you join us today from, from DC and, and thank you so very much. We'll do many more things together, I am sure. And so with that, I wanted to um, bring up Jonna Mazet from UC Davis and to talk about the preparedness, um, the pandemic preparedness workshop and that we were partnering with them on just recently. Thanks, Sarah. And you're going to hear some of the same themes that you just heard from both Marks, which I guess is a good thing, right? Um, so we want to, um, UC Davis and several programs there partnered together in this workshop with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And we were so thrilled to have actually many of the organizations in this room were represented. Mary was there. Um, so uh, the goal was really to bring together um, folks from uh, university, nonprofits, private sectors, together with public health partners, especially their own local public health partners, into a conversation that spanned every corner, uh, every region of this country to say, what did we do? What did we, should have we done? Who <laughs> shoulda, coulda, woulda? Um, and um, and where are we going from here and how can we learn from what happened here and put out a roadmap really 
for how to do this better in the future. Um, so we established that we needed a, the sh a shared vision for optimal public health across sectors. Um, oh, little picture of me looking scary behind me all the time. <laughs> uh, and, um, and a well-trained, nimble, diverse workforce. And really we wanted to be on that path where we could have health security. Uh, for all. Um, and there, of course, I mentioned we went through some of those tragedies and terrible things and missed opportunities. I'm not going to focus on that. We only have a few minutes. Uh, I do want to share with you the key learnings. Um, and that number one of that was relationships are key. And that it is not time to build those relationships during a crisis, that we need to establish those cross sectoral relationships, especially with community based organizations now. Uh, if you already have them because you were great in doing that, or you are a CBO, fabulous. If you establish them during the pandemic, please keep them going. Work together, learn from each other in all of these realms. Um, but uh, also that those relationships, those cross-sectoral partnerships and relationships really work. Um, and we learned a lot from that engagement. And so we want to keep that going. Um, trust also, but we have to put equity first when we're thinking about um, these engagements. Um, and um, also just the acknowledgement that the online learning platforms are great and we can now do this, right? When people can't be there in person. Um, so in developing that roadmap, how do we get to that uh, health security for all? Um, the, there were literally hundreds of recommendations that are gonna come out and we're putting together a technical roadmap um, a playbook, if you will, as well as a policy brief. And Sarah's um, being uh, raised her hand to be instrumental in developing that policy brief to remind all of our public health entities and our government that these sectors need an on-ramp and have huge amounts to give uh, and to participate in, um, uh, you know, uh, both preparedness and then surge capacity and response at the time. So um, some just some key ones, uh, important to keep those relationships that you've built up going and keep those um, trust uh, and engagements going. Um, create uh, more formal ones when you were just sort of leaning on friends during this one to, to get involved. Um, we need to really find a way to pre-authorize some of the resources to be officially used. So laboratories, for example, every university in this state, if we're just talking about California, has PCR laboratories. Some of them have, like mine, coronavirus specialist laboratories. And yet those laboratories had no on-ramp. It took months, almost a year for many of us to be able to get involved and help with surge capacity. So my lab was helping people in Thailand and we couldn't test our own lab technicians or their parents. Um, during the the beginning of the pandemic. So that just, there was so many wasted opportunities and we need to do that safely, but we need to figure out ways to get communities back their genetic information, the strain typing, all of that stuff. Um, there are regulatory obstacles that were overcome again, months to, to almost a year into the pandemic that we can set up to never have to have that again. Um, so uh, in addition to that, we want to basically provide a national guard, kind of an activation um, to have those folks in all of these organizations that have these qualifications be able to be called up on emergency and keep their readiness available. We need better employment in public health, better opportunities and strategies to avoid burnout, to keep the people that are being trained in the profession. Um, and we need to make some necessary institutional changes, especially in academia, to make us a better partner for governments and public health entities, and we can do that. Um, and part of that is working towards improve it, improve scientific and health literacy and figuring out the whole misinformation um, conundrum and figuring out what we can do so much better. Um, there's a recommendation to create a coordinating council um, that includes uh, government entities, but also academics, CBOs, public and private entities, not-for-profits. And actually, Senator Gillibrand is starting a big bill uh, with using a One Health Task Force, actually, and creating a new um, deputy national 
um, security advisor just for this exactly. We'll see if that flies. Um, so there's a lot to do with the federal um, engagement, including establishing joint positions, early warning systems, um, securing long-term funding and emergency funding for the CBOs to be able to access um, right away. Um, that was a, a huge problem. Um, and then um, there, there's a lot of discussion about data sharing, platforms, um, actual feedback loops to clinicians, what can and can't be done, even in the U.S. space, even in this university's useful system um, for uh, electronic medical records are not awesome for being able to pick up any kind of early warning system. So in addition to those, there, again, there are many more, but in addition to those recommendations, some research areas that need to, that were highlighted by this group um, is that work needs to be done that sheds light on vulnerabilities, including social determinants of health and incorporates the One Health thinking um, in shaping policy and providing solutions. We need to optimize syndromic surveillance, just as I mentioned, but it needs to be a two-way street. It can't just be flowing one way to government and not coming back to the people and the people on the front lines. Um, we need better global viral surveillance at human-animal in interfaces to try to mitigate risk from the next one. Um, because it's not going to be one we've seen before, likely, right? Um, so we keep starting up more and more research now on SARS coronavirus too, but what's coming next may not be that and likely won't be that. Um, so we need more wildlife virus surveillance, um, improve vaccine targets and medical and technical innovations, and continue to evaluate and enhance some of the innovations like wastewater surveillance that were so useful here, but we can't just lose all of that and we need to use that model to continue. So, it over. Thank you, John. It was wonderful spending three days with people from all over the country who had come in to talk about these problems and, and to kind of collaborate to get that roadmap together. And the last partnership I want to talk about is um, I'm going to have Colin Boyle from our board come up, our board secretary, come up and talk about it. And it's the WHO Tech Task Force and our work with the WHO. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Colin Boyle, a uh, board member uh, with uh, Berkeley Haas, currently previously with UCSF. Nice to see you all. Um, are we still doing the uh, when I was 10 thing? because I can do that quickly. When I was 10, I was growing up in Brooklyn, New York, playing baseball uh, and watching a lot of really bad TV. And uh, one of the shows I think I watched was something called Green Acres. Does anybody remember Green Acres? Yeah, a number of you. For those of you who are a little younger, uh, be grateful. You never saw Green Acres. The, the basic premise was Eddie Albert was a wealthy industrialist, gentleman farmer type who falls in love with Ava Gabor, who was this sort of starlit Hollywood type. And they decide to move to the country, uh, have a cultural Flash, rural life, hijinks ensue. Terrible, terrible show. The reason I mention that is that culture clashes are part of what the Secretariat for uh, this, uh, the Alliance here, that the task force has to deal with, because it's hard to think of two cultures more dissimilar than Silicon Valley and the World Health Organization. On the one hand, you have a hyper risk averse bureaucracy, first do no harm, second do no harm, third, are you sure? many years of like regulatory review for guideline approvals and the like. On the other side, you have, you know, move fast and break things, disruptive innovation and like product cycles that last a couple of hours, maybe a week, the product life cycle is much more compressed. Yet these two communities really do need each other because uh, as we've seen in the pandemic, it's really critical to have uh, the right information, official quality information provided through the reach and scale that is available only through the tech sector. And so about two years ago, uh, some of the folks from WHO came to area to reach out to sort of start to make connections. Uh, it was an outgrowth of the digital health strategy that WHO had launched. And uh, there was this new virus kind of starting to circulate and maybe they needed to do some work on that. And so over uh, the last couple of quarters, the uh, Alliance has served as the secretariat for the WHO Tech Task Force, which has played, I think, a critical role for uh, con convening 30 to 40 different tech companies with WHO under the leadership of Andy Patterson to start to improve the quality of content that's made available, to start to reduce the visibility of, of content that is inaccurate or misleading, 
and to support uh, the tech sector on a number of different, and WHO on a number of different projects that really leverage the digital channels that are there. Uh, it's been really exciting to see WHO start to sort of stretch into unfamiliar territories and take some risks in this area, but it's really been important. And uh, we were very fortunate last week, uh, Andy uh, and two of his colleagues from the WHO came out for a series of meetings here with uh, academics, with uh, members of the tech community, a big uh, convening at, um, at LinkedIn uh, to sort of update everyone on the progress. They've literally done hundreds of projects of various sorts to try to improve the quality of information flow going through digital channels. So this is a wonderful place for the Alliance to, to play a role because we can really bring different sectors together effectively. And I'm hopeful that uh, once we get sort of a bit further on, uh, some of the innovations that have emerged here on that are really outgrowths of the COVID situation can start to permeate other parts of the WHO. And we've seen some interesting applications of technologies uh, at WHO in the way they communicate guidelines and other things in other areas outside of COVID. So uh, with that, I'm just very excited about that um, uh, partnership and congratulations to Sarah and everybody for the great work they've done in forging it. Thank you so much, Colin, and thank you all too. And again, thank you UCSF for providing us the space to have meetings. We were able to host them. We had a, a briefing here. We had them able to take all of their bilaterals upstairs in this building, um, which made it really nice for them and they were deeply appreciative. So thank you so much. I want to just close the meeting now because I know not to stand between you all and having the opportunity to get to know each other more, get a few, uh, get some food and drink inside of all of you and to figure out really how we can work together. So whether it's this afternoon or another time soon, I hope you'll be reaching out to me and to my team to let us know what more we can do to help because that's what we're here. We're here to support all of you and to figure out how we can make more collaborations so that we can all do what we want to do, which is to advance global health equity. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for coming to this meeting, bearing with us through kind of uh, the, the hybrid model, and we just so appreciate all of you. So thank you very much.